I worked for Redmond now in 1989. And um, there was one death on that site, and there was loads of major accidents. We was uh, on the Dublin's Light Railway, we went underground from Tower Hill to Bank Station. We got organised as uh, workers. I was elected safety rep. After I was elected safety rep, we had no more deaths on the site, and we had no more major accidents. And my um, thanks for that was to be blacklisted by Edmund Nuttall and placed on the blacklist at the age of 24 years of age. I've never drove a tower crane again, although I'd love to. I'm a clapped out caddy now. No justice! No peace! No justice! This is the story of how construction companies have worked to keep trade union activists off their sites. How these efforts have left workers exposed to dangerous working conditions and how, over many years, the state has colluded in this practice. No peace! No peace! That, that when both sides you went on to, and you know what the experience, the first time I went on to was when they said they're death traps. And, then, and every time you pick up the papers, another building was got killed. And, and periods are booming, as they say, and they're, they're, they're killing up to 200 building workers in a year. And then, and then they're, they're maiming thousands more, putting thousands literally in wheelchairs, like, you know, you know crippling them, like, disfiguring them, you know. And, and I thought, this must, we must be able to put a stop to this. What the hell is the point of having a trade union if you can't stop, you know, building employers, killing and maiming us? Surely the, the, the first and most essential thing is your life and limbs. What's the evidence that unionised building sites are safer than ununionised sites? Well, I mean, there's quite a lot of documentary evidence going back almost 20 years now about the effectiveness of safety reps on sites. Uh, there are really two key pieces of research. The first was the Riley, Patchy and Holt study from 1995. Uh, that said for the first time very clearly that where you've got effective union health and safety reps and effective committee structure, you'd have about 50% less major injuries. There's a second piece of documentary research done in 2002, uh, both in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. That looked specifically at construction. Uh, that was led by McDonald's. And again, they saw there, with proper consultation structures, effective, well-trained safety reps, a far greater health and safety performance, far fewer injuries, particularly on larger construction sites. And um, presumably the industry is aware of these studies. Well, you would hope so. I mean, there's 20 years of research on this. Do you get any sense why construction industry employers are so resistant to working in this way? Well, I think we have to look at the history. And, and part of that actually is the development of the lump as an idea in the late 60s. Um, what that allowed is the industry as a whole to largely casualise the workforce. You know, direct labour and direct employment in construction is historically very low. That's meant a lack of skills, a lack of permanence on site, and it means as a result that very well-trained union safety reps are not often present on site. Because of that, there's a, a lack of understanding of the value that's bought, the benefits that are bought, because reps are, are rarely present on site long enough be able to make a real strong tangible difference. Where they have done things like the 2012 Olympics, fantastic example of how good quality, proper worker involvement absolutely has transformative power in terms of health and safety performance. The companies want control of the health and safety themselves, and it'll, they, they, they seem to it now, and we've got clear evidence that they're making sure that health and safety remains in a tight grip of the management. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen the hypocrisy of this on the huge sites where just up the road, Media City, the single biggest site in Britain, uh, and we, you've got the, the, the companies supplied to put forward their own um, unelected, untrained uh, safety deck. And when lads go to in with safety problems, they'll be swiftly removed from the site. Uh, for, for all the rubbish that's talked about for some employers, all we believe in safety, that's rubbish on the ground, when the, the foreman's criticised because he never had a proper scaffolding in place, he won't like the person saying it. He's a safety rep and they take it out of him. The health and safety was the main issue on everything. I actually worked on the underground in Liverpool for three years when it was getting built, called a loop line, and there was not a facility or anything. We had the health and safety by the fist. We made sure that the men were safe, the men were paid good wages, 
and they, were, they worked in good conditions. That's why the employer doesn't want, he wants bad conditions where he can make most profits. He doesn't give a hell about the health and safety. It costs them money. So what's the first entry on your yeah, black? Uh, the, the first entry on there is uh, from Taylor Woodrow's. Uh, it, it, it says, uh, I was an instigator. Uh, there was a strike and I was one of the instigators of, of, of the strike. And it, and, uh, um, uh, yeah, 78, 79 uh, uh, for them. Yeah. And what was the strike about? Uh, it was two, two reasons. Um, one was a health and safety reason, and one was a, a bonus uh, reason. Whereas we caught the, uh, the the bosses, the contracts manager, and the bonus club were colluding in uh, robbing us of our bonuses. They was just basically looking out the window and saying, "Oh, they've done a bit more this week, and uh, we we'll, we'll, might pay them a bit more." And we went round and measured everything that we'd done. We caught them, you know, they was doing it week after week. So that was one one area of dispute. And then the other one was a health and safety one, where the uh, the crane driver, his cab was on on the roof of the building, which was seven floors high, and he and the jib came out off the, off the roof, and he could not see the ground. But the building industry, as people probably know, building contractors are probably not the most civilized of human beings, and the people they hire to run their projects are not normally the sort of people you'd want to socialize with. And you used to find that things like bullying were rampant in the construction industry. And then. They brought on some heavies onto, onto the a site. Uh, a big uh, guy from Connemara, who was a ganger, and he, he came up and introduced himself to me and said, um, my name's Mal. Uh, do you know why I'm called Mal? I said, well, what's your name, Malcolm? And he said, no, I'm, a, I'm an animal. And I just, uh, just sort of shook my head and laughed, and, uh, and he tried to bully people to to use the uh, the crane and to load up. One day, he uh, decided he would show everybody how it was done. So he loaded up this barra of uh, 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 metal uh, for the plumbers, and uh, he uh, and as he he had rubber gloves on, and as he was doing it, he shouted up to tighten the chains, and the the, the driver heard him. He tightened up the chains, but he caught his little finger in the chain and he yelled with pain and, and the driver, crane driver, thought he was yelling for him to take the the, the, um, the barra up and of course he started pulling up the barra and uh, he was pulling Big Mal up with it by his little finger. You've seen a copy of your Blacklist file, um, what were you initially blacklisted for? Uh, in 1992 my name was added to the Blacklist file because of, I was involved in a dispute about several weeks unpaid wages. Um, it was Balfour B who put my name on that list. Um, what else are you on the on the blacklist for? Well once my name was on it, over the years, if I ever became the union safety rep, that would be recorded and in fact my credentials as a safety rep would be sent to the uh, uh, blacklist. Um, I complained about overflowing toilets, I complained about uh, unpaid, unsafe scaffolding, I complained about the way asbestos was being removed. Uh, we pulled him, got him down, uh, got, got, he was in a lot of pain and taken to hospital and, uh, and he, never, he never came back to work. And uh, the fan, actually the storeman picked his gloves up and took it, uh, put them in the stores and it'd be about a week, two weeks later there was a huge smell from the stores coming and his finger was in the, in the rubber gloves. Yeah, that was, uh, that, was, that was why I was blacklisted. People reading their colour supplements and they see pictures of the third world, pictures that Sebastian Salgado has taken, and they think that you know this, this only happens abroad. Well, it's probably happening in a city centre very close to where you are now. Is this all profit driven? It is. Yeah. It's about that. And, 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 and when you think of it, it just people just pause a little bit, and that's what the employers are there for. And the employers in the construction industry took this responsibility very seriously. For decades, they operated a blacklist of union activists and others they fear would raise safety issues and slow down their projects. In 1993, Callum McAlpine, a director of Sir Robert McAlpine, set up a secret body called the Consulting Association, run by a man called Ian Kerr, to operate this blacklist. The directors of the Consulting Association were drawn from the heads of HR of subscribing companies. 
Each company would feed in names to the blacklist and check the names of proposed employees of their subcontractors against the blacklist before allowing them on site. During the lifetime of the organisation, more than 40 companies subscribed at one time or another. My blacklist, which I've got in front of me now, is goes back to 1975. My Calpines were the first one to have me on the blacklist. And since then, other companies have put me on the blacklist and basically I've spent years and years out of, out of work, unemployment, four kids, married, and basically they've completely ruined my life. The situation being I couldn't live with my kids the way they wanted to be brought up, holidays and everything, and I was denied my human rights through what these people were doing. I've not had one agency phone me in ten years, and that's a fact. Well, I've, I've had one or two phone me. I was even I was even given given a job at the ex Cheetah Mill bus station, and I was that was on a Wednesday. I was told back to phone back on Friday for the details. When I phoned back, they said, "Oh, I'm sorry, um, the position's already been filled." That was after yeah, well, that was after they given my uh, national yeah. insurance number. You get to a certain stage in in your life, if you like, as a tradesman. You've uh, you've learned you've learned the tricks. You, you're quite capable. You're hard working, and the fact that somebody is depriving you of earning a living is uh, it does get you a little bit, you know. You're sort of going from you're sort of going you're very marginalised, going from one job to another job, and it this this getting a this getting of a job and saving some money, you know, become very central to your way of life. With no social life, basically. Their social life had to go, you know. And uh, I felt quite often at times, like, you know, that I was under house arrest. It's like a form of house arrest when you have nothing. You don't have the means to actually get out and socialise and enjoy yourself and lead a, a, a life that, that most people take for granted, you know. If you go home to your wife and say, I'm sorry, I can't get a job, I can't give you, I can't give you money for extra money for food, or we can't buy any luxuries, or things like that. Eventually, wives are fairly tolerant to a, to a high degree, but eventually they get fed up, or some wives get fed up. But another effect is that the more you sort of uh, struggle with it, the more you want to fight it. So it sort of, uh, it sort of sucks you more and more into the uh, sort of an all-consuming sort of uh, thing, you know, uh, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe too much so, you know. But in February 2009, the intervention of the Information Commissioner's Office appeared to change everything. The ICO's website boasts it is the UK's independent authority set up to uphold information rights in the public interest, promoting openness by public bodies and data privacy for individuals. How did the ICO um, get onto the issue of what the Consulting Association have been doing? Uh, the ICO has never confirmed exactly how they got the information. We know they had a whistleblower who told them that there was a large amount of secret information um, being concealed at the Consulting Association related to blacklisting. They went into the offices, they announced why they were there, and Ian Kerr then told them exactly where to look for what they wanted, and they only took away the boxes that he specified. Everything else they left behind. They did take some laptops, but they returned them to him without looking in them. Um, and we know from Ian Kerr's own evidence that immediately after the raid, he then took everything outside and burnt the rest. So we'll never know what was in the other sort of 90 to 95 percent of the material. The Information Commissioner's people um, didn't seize a file relating to the Offshore Industry Liaison Committee. Um, can you explain the significance of that? Yeah, we were very baffled why they didn't see that. Uh, no logical explanations come through. Why they didn't see that there was a file on the OILC, which are now part of the RMT. And uh, I think it was another RMT file as well, we're, we're led to believe. I think the significance of it is that there's a lot of people who are now blacklisted uh, who don't know and can't access that information. And these are people who've been working for a long time and in that environment. Many of them have just raised health and safety concerns in a, in a very dangerous environment. The North Sea, you can imagine, the strong winds, gales, huge waves. And uh, for, for raising these concerns, they've been effectively blacklisted. And after the existence of the Consulting Association became public knowledge in 2009, 
Parliament's Scottish Affairs Committee conducted an investigation. You've seen many of the blacklist files. Um, how would you characterise the information that the Consulting Association was holding on these workers? Well, the Consulting Association were obviously providing a service to employers that would allow them, the employers, to stop coming onto their site or to refuse work uh, to those that they thought might be difficult. Now, by difficult, they meant that they were going to be combative when it came to health and safety issues, or they were going to be active in trade unions. The, the blacklist was essentially operated in order to maximise profits for the, for the construction companies. They wanted to be able to cut corners on health and safety without having employees uh, objecting to this and possibly delaying the job. And how did they deal with the material which they had seized? Uh, they returned the laptops because they concluded without looking at them that they didn't need any further investigation and they um, contacted the companies that they were able to identify who had been involved with the Consulting Association and wrote them a warning letter. But they made no effort to contact the uh, people on the blacklist? No, they never did. In fact, they only uh, started considering it when in 2011 the GMB and Liberty wrote to them jointly asking what action they were proposing to take in relation to the blacklisted workers. Um, initially we were fobbed off um, and then we insisted on a meeting and threatened that we were going to take legal proceedings if they failed to meet with us. Uh, we then had a meeting with the ICO where they explained to us that it would be impossible to contact these people um, because construction workers were by nature itinerant and therefore would probably have moved. That was actually their explanation and it was in fact in that meeting that we pointed out that they had all the national insurance numbers and therefore as a regulator they could easily contact the DWP. That was the first time they'd actually thought about it. They only decided to prosecute Ian Kerr rather than any of the directors. Was there a, an obvious legal justification for that distinction? Well, I wouldn't say there was an obvious legal justification. I, I think the reason they gave is that they could only bring proceedings against the Consulting Association and it wasn't their job to look beyond that in, in terms of how it was funded or operated. And incredibly, the blacklisting continued on the most high-profile construction project in the country. Today on the Olympics, there are construction workers who, because their name comes up on an illegal blacklist, operated by multinational companies, cannot get work. The blacklisting support group took up the cases of these workers, including Dave Olvash, an electrician who was sacked despite hitting all productivity targets and having a 100% attendance record. A supervisor explained to Frank Morris, one of the other workers on the site, that he had been sacked, quote, because his name had come up on a list. He was a union man, a known troublemaker. Frank, seen here picketing the Olympic site, reported this information back to Dave Olvash and paid a heavy price. I told him what the foreman was saying. He started a tribunal. And then I couldn't get anywhere. It's not like I got bloody so glad. But they moved me off the job straight away in the Olympics. And they transferred me down to Belmarsh Prison. Like this was another contract, the contract they had. Then they just started victimising me, letting me have it, threatening me. I had to call the police one occasion down there because there were threats of violence. And then uh, eventually they sat me. And then I couldn't get any work. I was a year out of work straight. Bang. Couldn't get anything. From, from being full time employed, to not getting, not getting nothing. Uh, eventually, like, we paid my mortgage on the uh, credit cards, had to go bust, went into liquidation, try and save, you know what I mean? So that, that's how my finances went. The Blacklist support group tried to publicise their cases. The man walking around, Frank Morris, has been threatened by police, he's been dismissed for organising. Uh, but it was the Olympics, and nobody least of all the International Olympic Committee, outside whose hotel these scenes took place, wanted to listen. Eventually Frank got a job with a small tunnelling firm and wound up working on Crossrail. Oh, I went over to Crossrail then, in a couple of weeks, the management came in to me and goes, you're a union man. Shortly after, we raised safety issues, but I was moved out of the, the work area, banned from the construction site, wasn't allowed there, eight weeks. I was stuck in a tin hut, not allowed to didn't want to let them do any work. 
then I stuck it out, I had nowhere to go. They eventually they just swept the board of the company, just sacked the whole company off the site. And everyone on the site is going, we've all lost our jobs because of you. After a lengthy campaign of demonstrations and direct action, Frank Morris was reinstated. But the tunnelling company he had worked for, which had traded successfully for 12 years, was forced into liquidation. Crossrail declined to be interviewed for this film. Crossrail is one of the biggest projects around the country today. And what they're telling us is the biggest employer, the biggest project is going to have no rights, no trade union activity, and if you step out of line, you're going to be sacked. How are Crossrail getting away with being so hostile to unions when they are a publicly funded project? Mainly because it's a hostile government, isn't it? Speaking to businessmen and women in Berkshire in January 2012, David Cameron undertook, in his own words, to kill off the health and safety culture for good. The key about health and safety is it not, it's not just the rules and the laws and the regulations, it's also the culture of fear that many businesses have about health and safety. And that culture of fear partly comes from a very litigious situation that we now have where businesses fear they're endlessly going to be taken to court. In the five years of the first coalition government, we see a collapse in agency resourcing, in enforcement activity, in inspection, in prosecution. All of these things are now more concentrated and more targeted. It's the natural reaction to having far less people out in the field and having far less resources to work with. We knew there would be a cut in the agency budget. We expected that. All government departments had it. It was an austerity package. But agency had cut to the bone. We have a rump HSE left. And in this parliament, they face further cuts. And so we see those work-related deaths start to creep back up. Deaths in construction, which have been going down, start to come back up again. The Health and Safety Executive record numerous serious accidents every year in that environment. And of course, we have to remember the Piper Alpha disaster and the events that led up to that. In the current climate, we're cutting jobs in the North Sea and trying to change the shift patterns. The, the maintenance on the rigs is falling behind because they're laying people off, the maintenance is not getting done, and we fear a repetition of Piper Alpha or something similar. Can you talk about the legal proceedings that are now being brought against the, uh, uh, the, the blacklisting companies? I can. I mean, the, uh, initially we looked at what the ICO had done. The ICO wrote to all of the companies. I think they confirmed to us that they received 14 replies. They didn't follow up with any of the companies that did not reply or ignored them. And the companies that did reply, I think only a small fraction of those 14 who replied actually said they would stop doing it. The others all denied any involvement. Um, that was as far as it went with the ICO, and it was at that point we began to look at what other action we could bring for members. We started proceedings with them jointly with the Blacklist Support Group, who had started their own proceedings and we were joined together, and Unite and UCAT also came in at that point, so we had a group litigation. And we're bringing claims for invasion of privacy, defamation and conspiracy. So Robert McAlpine, one of the principal defendants in this case, ignored a request for an interview for this film. And Dave Smith pursued his own claim against Carillion. You eventually sued Carillion, uh, one of the blacklisting companies. Um, how did that go? Yeah, we took an employment tribunal against Carillion, uh, and on the very first day, the lawyer for Carillion handed a document to the judge where uh, they admitted that the company had blacklisted me. Uh, they admitted it was their managers that put the information on my blacklist file. They even named the manager and told us he was based in their Wolverhampton head office. Um, they admitted that the reason they did it was because I was a trade union member. And they admitted that the reason they did it was because I'd raised concerns about health and safety on their building sites. So, did you win? No, we still lost. Um, we lost because I was an agency worker and agency workers in this country haven't got uh, the same legal rights as, uh, as normal directly employed workers, uh, but it basically being treated as second class citizens, even when they're breaching our human rights. Eventually, rather than see their employees cross-examined under oath, the construction companies settled out of court. Fuck them all, Fuck them all. Fuck them all. Fuck them. 
Seven years ago, I hosted a meeting in the House of Commons in a small, well, actually it was on a bench first of all, we couldn't even get a room, and we set up the Blacklist Support Group. And at that point in time, to be frank, we had few friends, but as a result of the determination of the Blacklisted workers themselves, we continued the campaign, exposed the Blacklisting that was taking place, exposed the hardships of the workers themselves, but also their families had suffered so much, some people not working and some of them not surviving. Now what we've achieved as a result of that campaign with the support of our trade unions is yes, compensation on a large scale, but to be frank, that's just the first stage. We've always demanded a full public and independent inquiry. Yes! We want these people brought to justice for what they did. Compensation is one thing, but justice is another. Can you tell us about what happened on the final day in court? Well, uh, when the uh, em employers, uh, barristers, stood up to apologise and say they're very sorry and never going to do it again and all that stuff, Dave Smith stood up and interrupted them very uh, abruptly and said that we don't uh, accept their apology because we, we know they don't mean it. They're just uh, sorry that they were caught at it. And, uh, and he made a very good speech uh, attacking their motives. And uh, we stood up with him because we were concerned that uh, the, uh, the police or the security would come in and try and drag Dave out. But uh, so we, we surrounded him and uh, he, he finished his speech and uh, the judge looked uh, bit shaken by it. He visibly jumped when Dave stood up and started uh, to say that we didn't accept their apology and never would until we get them in court. When Dave got up and spoke and said we didn't accept their apology because they were, they were only sorry for being caught, that was one, uh, you know, only the second one uh, building worker who actually got to speak in court. So we wanted our day in court to actually tell people on record what, what really happened to us and uh, we wanted um, Callum McAlpine and the rest of the gangsters uh, in court as well to uh, answer for their uh, crimes against us. Okay. And um, cynicism so about the industry's expression of remorse seems well founded. The, uh, as Frank Morris, now on the National Executive uh, well, Committee of the Union Unite, explains... What's the evidence that blacklisting is, continues to be a problem? Uh, well, the main evidence is that uh, a lot of the guys we know are still not working. We've got two guys on the London Construction branch who have taken positions. They have no previous files for the Association. They find it almost impossible to get work. Since they've taken up union roles? Since they've taken up union roles. We've got uh, the branch sector in Teesside. He's having the same problem. He's been unemployed for it's starting to look like a number of years now. He's recently taken a tribunal against a firm in his local area for failure to employ him. And it didn't get caught, it got settled outside court. But he's still not working. Looking backwards, there clearly ought to be a public inquiry, and there ought to be a vigorous pursuit of those who were involved in blacklisting. I have been appalled, and so have the committee have been appalled, at the way in which the professional associations, for example, um, both those involving human resource personnel and others in the industry seem to be washing their hands of these sorts of issues. But looking forward, we ought to be encouraging best practice, both by dialogue between companies and unions and involving government as well, uh, but also we ought to be making sure that the public sector, as the main procurement agency for construction work, sets high standard and only allows onto uh, short, short lists or tender lists, those companies who are operating to the highest standard, um, who are offering genuine effort, making genuine efforts to address health and safety issues, have dealt with the crimes that they committed in the past in terms of blacklisting, and are offering a constructive and positive way forward for the future. Was the committee unanimous on this, the view that this is the way forward? Yes, I mean, one of the interesting things about this report 
which even though I, as a Labour MP, was chairing the committee, did actually have a majority of government supporters, that was Tories and Liberals at that time, was that the committee was unanimous. So that you had Conservatives, Liber, Liberals, Labour members and the, the SNP all supportive of this drive to tackle blacklisting and make sure that it was stamped out in the construction industry. Since Ian Davidson lost his seat in 2015 to the SNP, Parliament's Scottish Affairs Committee has taken no further steps in this matter. The files have shown up some evidence of police involvement in the blacklisting um, operation. Can you tell us about, about that? Yeah, that's some of the most frustrating evidence that's emerging. On the files that we've seen, there's clear evidence of um, some kind of police cooperation, stating when people are at demonstrations or at uh, different kind of activities which are being policed, where they are not charged or arrested in any way, but they've obviously been noticed and that information has somehow fed back into the Construction Industry Association files. Now, the, the only evidence that we've been able to find about it specifically, given that 95% of it was left behind in the INCA's office, is that there are minutes to security meetings. At this point, the ICO has refused to hand those over because they say they're not strictly relevant. And the evidence of covert links between employers and the state was all the way back to the opening decades of the 20th century. In 1917, the world was stunned by the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Closer to home, the Labour Party had just adopted Clause 4, making the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange party policy. Hundreds of thousands of newly enfranchised members of the working class were returning home with weapons training, and a near revolution on Clydeside had shown how far things might go. The employer's response, under the leadership of Admiral Reginald Hall, a former director of naval intelligence and now a senior Conservative MP, was to establish a body called the Economic League to defend their interests. Publicly, they fought what they described as a crusade for capitalism, deploying speakers at factory gates, armed with pre-prepared speeches in defense of the status quo. Secretly, they developed a blacklist of politically undesirable workers, and in this approach, they had the support of the state. In 1937, the Morning Star obtained copies of letters which showed that Special Branch in Birmingham had provided the League with details of local communists. In the post-war years, the Economic League published literature and ran courses for employees of its subscribing companies, justifying the existing economic order and senior League employees have confirmed that at the same time they continued to exchange information with the state surveillance apparatus. Through the 1980s, campaigning journalists like Paul Foote had continued to expose the League's blacklist and shine a spotlight on its inadequacies. And at the same time, Thatcherism achieved the ideological victory over organised labour which the League had been fighting for, making subscription to the League unnecessary. Insolvent, discredited and deprived of any real purpose, the organisation was wound up in 1991. But the construction companies were different. They no longer feared a revolution, but they still wanted to keep trade unionists off their sides. So Callum McAlpine paid the Economic League £10,000 for the information it held on construction workers. He established the Consulting Association to manage the information and the blacklisting continued. Evidence of hidden state support for the employers also emerged during the 1972 building workers strike. This dispute had been unusually successful in uniting workers in a fight for higher wages and safer working conditions. After the strike employers submitted a complaint about the conduct of pickets, but even the Financial Times described the document as more like a political pamphlet than a serious study. The police chief in charge on the day had thanked the pickets for the way in which they had conducted themselves and the government lawyers involved initially recommended that there should be no prosecution. But six months after the event, the decision not to prosecute was reversed. After a series of acquittals at Mould Crown Court, trial procedures were hastily changed to prevent the defendants objecting to jury members with links to the construction industry. 
and, at a subsequent trial, three pickets, including Ricky Tomlinson, were jailed under a 19th century act, which had not been used for 98 years. Now listen to this. We live in a so-called democracy, and they're supposed to pay by the rules. And there's policemen out there, and I want these police lads to listen, because they get involved in this without them knowing about it. Our telephones were tapped in the, in the 1970s. And how do I know about it? Because it came out in the trial, but in a very odd way. Desi Warren said, my phone's tapped. And Morris Drake, the QC, the prosecuting counsel, said, don't be ridiculous. We don't tap, we don't bug people's phones in this country. Desi said, well, you bugged mine. And he said, well, what makes you think that? And Desi said, because I haven't paid the fucking bill for two years. <laughs> And when I went down to the archives, we made a programme called One Life and went down to the National Archives to get my files because they should have been released under the 30-year law. And on the first page of mine, in big red letters, that confidential. And you turn that page over, in big black letters, it's got private. And you turn that page over and then it's got things like uh, Len Murray of the Trade Union Care Council was, it was approached by, and all the names are blanked out. And it goes right on to the very last paragraph when it says, all this information is withheld in the interest of national security. So this is the last communication I've had from Jack Straw. This is, this is practically brand new. And it's the, the purpose of retaining Section 23 information is to protect the space, the space within which the security agents, a, agencies, vital to our national security as they are, operate. And then it goes on to say, I am satisfied that the Shrewsbury business falls into this category of other special reasons under the Public Records Act. So in other words, they're saying there, they're admitting that the, the, uh, the security services were deeply, deeply involved in our case and in many other... Further evidence of state interference in the trial came from documents showing the Information Research Department, a section of the Foreign Office, had played a role in getting a programme called Reds Under the Beds, screened in the Shrewsbury area during the trial, complete with a studio discussion involving a Conservative MP making allegations of violent conduct by pickets during the building strike. The judge dismissed the suggestion this represented contempt of court. But despite this history, despite the clear evidence of police contributions to the blacklist, despite the Independent Police Complaints Commission stating it is likely that all sections of Special Branch contributed information about potential employees, Operation Hearn, the police's own investigation, claims there is no evidence of collusion with the Economic League or the Consulting Association. Meanwhile, a succession of senior police officers with a background in surveillance of domestic extremists have taken up lucrative jobs in corporate security with large construction companies. Helen Steele, one of the two defendants in the McLeibel case, has direct experience of the consequences of the crossover between the police and corporate security. Um, well, I was one of two people who were sued by McDonald's in the 1990s over a leaflet uh, criticising their business practices. And um, both myself and Dave Morris, who were the defendants in that in the long-running McLeibel trial, we both found out that we were on the uh, blacklist held by the Consulting Association. And what did you learn about the links between corporate security of McDonald's and the Metropolitan Police during the trial? Well, during the trial, um, Sid Nicholson, who was McDonald's head of security uh, and had previously had a 30-year career in the Metropolitan Police, uh, he said on oath that all of McDonald's security department were ex-policemen and that uh, if they wanted information about campaigners, they would go to their contacts in the police uh, to find it out. And we also found out during the trial that uh, McDonald's had received information from Special Branch, um, some of it completely inaccurate about people who were involved in the anti-McDonald's campaign. And so <clears throat> when when the McLeibel trial finished, uh, we started proceedings against the Metropolitan Police uh, over misfeasance in office and breach of the data protection uh, laws um, and for, for giving information to McDonald's that was private and confidential. and. Um, as a result of suing them for that, we received an out-of-court settlement where they paid substantial damages, but also they, they made a public undertaking uh, to bring the 
settlement to the attention of all the area officers in the police force uh, to make sure that officers were aware of their obligations not to disclose uh, private information on the police computer to third parties. That was in that was in 2000, which is actually long before uh, a lot of these these uh, cases have been exposed regarding information going from the police to the consulting association blacklist. On the basis of her experiences, Helen Steele, who spent three years in a relationship with a man she didn't know was an undercover police officer, has been granted core participant status at the Pitchford inquiry into undercover policing. You're also a core participant in the Pitchford inquiry. Why have you been given that status? Um, because over the years as an activist I've been in contact with a number of undercover police officers who have infiltrated trade unions and anti-racism campaigns. Uh, back in the 90s I knew Peter Francis. Um, in the late 90s I knew Mark Jenner who was uh, an undercover police officer who infiltrated UCAT. Um, uh, I was on picket lines with him and protests with him. Um, and about 10 years ago, I knew an undercover police officer called Carlo Neri, um, uh, and that's why we've been given core participant status. And, and there's evidence that you've been spied on personally as well. Yeah, every British citizen is allowed to apply under what's known as a subject access request to get a copy of their own uh, police files. Um, and in response to my request, I've been turned down, been given my file, uh, and the reason stated is a potential breach of national security and ongoing uh, investigations. And actually the, the Blacklist Support Group as an organisation has also put in FOI requests to, to, to various different police authorities and the response we get back from them is that they can neither confirm nor deny whether the Blacklist Support Group is currently being spied on uh, and neither confirm nor deny is the uh, thing they use in every single situation when they're actually spying on people. Given that you've spent most of your time fighting for stuff that you're entitled to, does it surprise you that the state seems to be making more efforts to uh, challenge you than support you? Surprised? Not at all. I was shocked at the level of intrusion, but surprised, no. Um, this is labour versus capital. And in any big major industrial battle between big business and the trade unions, the state is never neutral. The state is always on the side of the employers.